For this week's segment of The Rear View, presented by B.F. Goodrich, we're going to watch you take on Nikki Van Dyke in the quarterfinals of that 2017 Maui Women's Pro. As always, The Rear View is sponsored by B.F. Goodrich Tires. B.F. Goodrich is celebrating 150 years in 2020. And if you want to wish B.F. Goodrich a happy 150th, you can tag at B.F. Goodrich Tires and use the hashtag BFG and WSL. Tag us and let you know what you think of the rearview segments and which ones you want to see in the future, and they might just make it onto the show. Happy 150th to BF Goodrich, and thanks for supporting these conversations. All right, so the scene set for this week's rearview, it's 2017. This is the Maui Women's Pro. It's the final event of the year. It's event number 10. You started this season with a 13th and a 5th, and then you were injured for four events. Can you tell us what was going on? Yeah, I had um, a major injury. I unfortunately tore my MCL at Margaret River, and that was my biggest and first injury of my career. And so um, that was one of my worst fears ever is um, being injured and not being able to serve. And it happened. And so um, luckily, I had a great team to help me get back and healthy. Um, and I spent a lot of time in California with Dr. Romine and we um, did all the right steps to get me healthy for this event. And Honolulu Bay for you in particular, and we're watching you tear this wave apart. Like, what does this wave mean to you in, in terms of just you being a surfer? Um, it really is for me growing up and watching this event um, before I got on tour, it was a goal to be able to surf there. It was the dream. It's the dream. And um, to be able to have an event in Hawaii again for the women and the waves that we got this year. I mean, it was pretty surreal and just amazing to feel a sense of home at, an, at one event, at least in the year. It, it, for you, that sense of home, it does it differ? I mean, I, I mean, it's it's considered one of the outer islands, right? In the sense of like, it's it's not Oahu, it's not the main island, and you're from Kauai. Is the vibe on Maui similar to to Kauai more so than Oahu? I think it's a mixture of Kauai and Oahu together. I think um, you know, there's a lot of Aloha spirit in Maui, and the locals are very very nice. I think um, it's so special that they can share this way with us. I feel bad every time we're getting firing because <laughs> they're so nice and they're just like, yeah, it's been fun to watch you, you know, my home break that's going off and I haven't seen it like this all year, but you go girl. <laughs> like, it's, so, <laughs> it's so different and I really appreciate it. And I love going island hopping over there. And you were injured for four events. You came back, um, 13th at Trestles, but then you got a third at Cash Guys, I think a fifth in France, and then you had a great event here in Maui. You, you mentioned that getting injured was one of your worst fears and that it happened, but do you also think that it was kind of maybe the universe telling you to take a pause and that that reset really helped, helped focus you for the back half of the year and, and the subsequent two? Absolutely. I think even the way it happened and how I literally was just riding out of a wave at the end section of Margaret's. I didn't do anything crazy and out of the ordinary. And it definitely looking back on it and through that process, it was definitely something that was just telling my body to take a break and um, you needed this in some way in shape or form. Um, and definitely one of the best thing that's that has ever happened to me is one of the worst as well. <laughs> and you mentioned that the, the bigger fear, I mean, there's the professional component, but just you being a surfer, not getting to surf, like how did you channel that energy while you were injured? Were you like dialing boards? Were you weight training? Were you, you know, I, I have no idea, like breaking down heat tactics. Like how do you, how do you kind of just get rid of that energy and, and, and put it to good use during that injured time? Honestly, it was tough in the beginning. Um, it took me about six weeks to come to terms with it and accept that everything's happening as it should. Um, it took me a really long time, but I was very busy uh, with rehab. I was waking up at five. I was training um, as much as I could with an injured knee. Um, and then I was doing physical therapy and then I was, you know, focusing on health and mental, mental capacities, um, during that time. And I really 
was exhausted by the end of the day that I didn't have as much time to think about that I wasn't getting in the water um, as normal. Now, your competitor in the quarterfinals here is Nikki Van Dyke. What do you think of Nikki? What's what's the unvarnished opinion of Malia Manuel? Do you like her? Do you guys, are you at odds? Do you talk during your heats? What's your relationship like? Oh, Nikki's great. We definitely don't talk during heats. Uh, <laughs> we did we did share a coach for a couple of years too, which was funny and a different dynamic. Um, and I, you know, I think Nikki and her relationship with Al Merrick's I think has been one of her strengths. I think she has really good placement and where she puts her board and her stability is very high level. And um, do you talk to anyone out, anyone on tour during heats? Um, I, I think here and there I'll have a couple little like one liners or whatever, but um <laughs> It just depends on the mood and the setting. I think it all really is, it, it depends. <laughs> so in this specific heat, at this specific specific event, as you're coming back from energy, uh, injury and you're really probably trying to put a stamp on your ear and announce that you're back, you know, how do you approach things like priority? Are you trying to get a lot of waves? Are you trying to identify the very best waves and take those? Like, how do you like to treat a heat like this? Um, well, here is so unique. I think... Um, the way the swell has to get into Honolulu is very different and specific, um, especially with a couple islands blocking most of the energy. And so it all depends on where you are. But I think Honolulu is a place that can have a lot of lulls, as we'll see in rewatching this heat. Um, and so there's a, a little bit of planning that has to go into it and how you want to approach um, getting the heat started and how. Um, if you want to waste a lot of time and wait, or if you want to just kind of get things going and get rid of that pressure of, um, you know, just sitting and waiting. You know, there's some waves on tour that are kind of, you don't have to be a local to have an advantage. You know, you just sort of understand the wave and, and you, you know, ability really shines through. Mm -hmm. Would you say Honolulu is actually one of those waves where understanding the rhythm and cadence of, of waves coming in and understanding what the wave is doing on a different swell direction really impacts your ability to make good decisions in a heat. I believe so. I think, um, anywhere in Hawaii really, because mm. most of, um, our swells are combo swells with, um, like a Northwest direction and more ideal, um, direction for Hawaii in the winter time. And so that comes with, different cadences of swells and uh, waves that hit reefs differently and how um, you approach and look for the right wave. You mentioned something about um, Nikki's boards here, and you also mentioned that that you'd been shifting shapers as well. I think you're on Mayhem's in, in this event. Who do you mm -hmm. ride for now? And and maybe, you know, your relationship with shapers, like how do you approach who you decide to ride for? Yeah, I, um, the, right before I qualified, I picked up a mayhem that Coco left because she didn't like the logo, I think, where the, where the logo was on the board. I was like, oh, I'll take this board and ended up qualifying on a mayhem and um, rode for him for about 10 years. Yeah. And so, um, did you keep yeah, the same nine, logos nine or 10 the whole years. time? <laughs> I, I, I shift, I shifted the logo place, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I was on, um, a mayhem here and a five, nine was my magic number for this particular spot and, um, had a lot of fun, um, trying all the different models over the years with Matt. And I think, um, like I said before, finding something to look forward to and something to switch things up over a period of time. Um, it was just that time. And um, Stace and I, I, I said, I wanted to do a, like a stab in the dark. I wanted to ride all these boards and I didn't want to know what, what boards they were. And we kind of did our own little Malia in the dark <laughs> <laughs> and um, ended up choosing Darren Hanley's. And a big part of that too is Darren is such a wonderful guy and his dedication and uh, motivation to ha take on uh, me as a project and see what we could elevate in my surfing. And I think it was that time where I had things I wanted to accomplish and um, he saw those and we started ticking away at those. 
That's such a cool story in terms of your approach, because because a lot goes into bias when you're like, I, I know the shaper, or I know the people that write as boards and you come in with these like preconceived notions over like I, it should be doing this or it's not going to do that. And I, I just think mm-hmm. the idea of, of trying a bunch of boards and not knowing who shaped them is such a cool way to go about it. How many boards are we talking about? Like five? Oh, not 50? that many. No, oh, no. We narrowed it down to uh, three shapers. Okay. So I tried some Almerics and JSs and some um, DHDs. Now I'm always interested in CT surfers because, um, most of them will say, I ride my my Ferrari model, my thruster every day, regardless of the conditions. But, you know, all these shapers that shape, you know, for world class surfers have a variety of models. Um, you know, Matt has mm-hmm. a ton of models like um, JS has a ton of models. As a professional surfer, do you ever take out like twin fins or, or sort of gravel boards or epoxies? Do you, do you experiment much with what you ride? Um, and if so, why? And if not, why? Um, over the years I have actually, the recent years I have, um, I have a really fun twin fin at the moment that, um, Darren shaped me and it's under his new acquired uh, company, um, modem. And mm-hmm. it's like a high performance fish, which has been really fun. I've gotten into longboarding in the summertime. And I think what I find so fun about, um, experimenting is just different feelings. I think, you know, we've spent thousands and thousands of hours on these high performance boards and or saving these high performance boards for, you know, those key moments um, through the year. And so it's been fun to kind of dabble in a way to get myself in the water and not treat it like my job um, sometimes. You know, as like a barely intermediate surfer and riding different shapes, whether it's like a mid-length or a fish or a shortboard, just being able to get um, like experience on different parts of the wave with what that board Mm -hmm. wants to do. And I feel like it's so transferable for me because then I take it back on the other boards because I'm like, oh, I didn't know like you can kind of sit in that section or I didn't know you could pull speed out of that section. And I'd imagine for someone like you and your peers, like with the level of knowledge you have on, on surfing and board riding, it would be so advantageous just to kind of experience, experiment a bit. Oh, absolutely. It's a total art form and kind of lets you let go of that high performance ego sometimes and mm. kind of just that like vulnerability of not knowing what a twin fin might do or what a section might do on a long board even. Like there's just so many different elements that kind of, are um, unexpected, which is fun to experiment with. You know, that last way we were looking at, um, you pulled an eight, an eight one, um, and, and, and Nikki's up now. Honolulu on days like this, it has like a very good barrel section, it also has an amazing uh, face for turn sections. Can you tell when you stand up which approach you're going to take? Are you going to hunt for the barrel? Are you going to drive off the bottom and try to do turns? Maybe break this wave down and and walk us through what's going on in your mind. Sometimes, I mean, right there, I was probably maybe waiting for something and it ended up not coming into fruition. I think um, Honolulu is a tricky wave. I think sometimes you can paddle in and know um, what the wave is going to do. And then again, sometimes mother nature just tells you differently and is like, nope, you know, focus what's on front of, in front of you. And, um, yeah, that's the beauty of having, um, this opportunity to, to surf a wave and all these different types of waves within 30 minutes with no one out. Are you working with a caddy, a caddy in this heat for your backup board? Um, I had, who did I have this year? I know, um, Stace did come over. Um, but I did have a couple of girlfriends from Kauai. We had a little girl pack. Um, and I think that was my, tr- that is my new tradition for Honolulu now is flying a few Kauai girls over and having my little click. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is one of those, it is one of those waves, even when it's maxing. I mean, it's not, not dangerous, but you don't have to be like an elite level professional to be like, here's your board. I'm out in the channel. I can get it back kind of thing. Whereas some spots it's like, I'm not going out there, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, right. Eat like Margaret's and stuff. Oh, no. yeah, try, <laughs> we'll see try. about that. I'll yeah, help good from luck. here. It sounds good. So yeah, Tyler would have it's... just, oh yeah. So Tyler would have just, just won the world title, the heat before. Um, do you have a relationship with Tyler? And if so, what's it like? 
Yeah, I'm, over the years, I've gotten to know Tyler better, and um, I think we had a really incredible conversation more recently um, when I was in Australia a few months ago. We caught up for lunch, and it was so cool to see her journey through what she's gone through. I think um, we related a lot you know i i had a lot of similarities and thoughts um going through injury mm. and so it was so fun to hear how she was looking at things in the approach and how we both were like oh like you know it's just the universe you know telling us to take a break and reevaluate and you know we're we want to be in control but we're kind of not you know at times um which is hard it's very it's very humbling because with surfing and being a professional surfer, for me at least, it's like you want to be in control. You can, you're in control of your schedule pretty much. You know where you're going to be, uh, you know, like where you're going to stay. And, what, you know, the you know, you're in control of your equipment and who you want around you. But then you're not in control of like the result or the outcome. But you're in control of like all the steps leading up to it. And so it was really fun to kind of go beyond that like superficial level of like, Hey, how you doing to like, Hey, how are you really doing? Of course. Yeah. And I mean, it, the, like being genuine and being open about things is such a, something you kind of discovers more and more valuable as you get older. Um, I, totally. I always think, and you mentioned this earlier, like, you know, and Tyler's another candidate, but you guys were both so young when you mm -hmm. really launched onto the international stage and like, all young people, like whether you're a professional athlete or not, like need time to like make mistakes and develop, but 99.99% okay. of them don't have to do it with a spotlight on them, you know, and oh, that's, 100%. it's a hard thing. And has that been mm -hmm. something that, that you've had to contend with? And, and if so, what have you kind of learned um, that's, that's put you in the best place possible? Yeah, I mean, like I said before, you know, growing up and having um, your career based off of opinions is difficult. And I think, in more recent years, I've kind of um, not let results define how I think I surf and my surfing and really focused on, um, you know, being and living that journey I want and how that reflects my surfing um, and kind of finding the, the little wins and, you know, kind of um, – caring less and getting rid of the questions that provoke anxiety with, you know, like, Oh, am I doing enough? Am I being enough? Does this person like the way I surf? Yada, yada. And inviting the questions that um, provoke improvement, you know, like always seeking um, how to develop yourself in a positive way. I mean, it's a great note. I mean, it is, I mean, I, we kind of joke about it, but surfing really is probably the most, the most consistently watched and passionately watched subjectively scored sport on the planet. You know, you get like, obviously there's disciplines in the Olympics that pop up every four years that probably get a lot yeah. of eyeballs, but like month in and month out, there's a subjectively scored sport that you guys are participating in. Totally. And even when I come back to Hawaii and I'm like in my off season and I'm like, having this time to have, you know, like this contemplative mindfulness and like, look at things in my year in a non judgmental way, I still have people giving me their two cents. Okay, well, and now I used to take that so to heart and like, really, you know, go like not even want to surf when I was home, because I was like, Oh, I have to listen to, you know, this person's opinion and like their look at it. And, you know, all I want to do is just be a hermit. And now I'm more like, <laughs> Uh, you don't get to be the critic unless you're standing in the arena with me is kind of uh, one of my favorite quotes from quotes from Brene Brown. She kind of, she is a vulnerability author and researcher. And that was kind of cool. Cause I was like, Oh, like you're right. Um, this is just reminding me, you know, the opinions that matter are just the people that are in my close circle. Um, my family, my friends, my coach, people that I trust that have seen, the sacrifices and know what it's like to put a jersey on and know the whole journey behind the scenes um, beyond uh, the dream that's looking from the outside in. Well, and that echo chamber of sometimes, oftentimes, anonymous criticism is so radical now with social media. If you think back like 20 years ago, yeah, people would be criticizing you and telling you what to do, but it's like the people you see on the street, you know, and now yeah. it's 
like anyone with a keyboard or a, a smartphone is an expert. Um, you know, most of them probably never very been bold. In the, yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> like, you know, never, ever been in the ocean, let alone, you know, surf the conditions you guys have to surf. Um, it's really interesting. And I think it's, it's one of those things. I know we talked about it, but it's one of those insights from the Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. And they were talking about all these things he did before it was a branding exercise and before social media came along like he did it to get better you know and he didn't mm-hmm. have to think about like this is my image i need to post a workout video so people think i'm working hard or a, a, a free surf clip to make them think i'm surfing hard mm-hmm. um he just did it because he's like mm-hmm. i want to win and it sounds like mm-hmm. that's kind of where you're landing as well where it's like no i found my own reasons for why i'm going to perform and get better totally i found my own whys i found what keeps me coming back to the ocean what keeps me coming back to competing and um finding that own trust in my own resilience and doing it for my my own personal journey and um I think that's really important and it's taken a long time (laughs) I mean Ian just reviewing some of the surfing you've done in this heat like these are world world class turns like world title caliber turns what do you think's changed in your surfing from from this event to now and from now to the next phase in your career? What do you think you have to work on in your surfing? Well, I think I've always had um, I've always been very dedicated to my craft and had that grit. I think a big misconception, I think, is like, oh, like, you know, I, I don't talk about wanting to win a world title as much as I maybe I should, but I, it doesn't mean I don't want to, you know? Um, and I think just have having more vulnerability and taking more risks, I think, um, is where I need to kind of put my foot in the door. Um, and, you know, realizing that I've been on tour for so long and like, where, where can I leap and make that like quantum leap? And where am I going to take those risks to go beyond and find out what's on the other side of that risk? That makes sense. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, we were looking at too earlier in the conversation are those like phases in your career and you're still so, so young, but we've been talking to a bunch of people obviously on this podcast and Some people are on tour and they're like, no, I'm just on tour. I mean, I want to surf well, but like, I'm not Mm -hmm. really thinking about a world title. Where do you fall in that camp? Is that something you think of year in and year out, even if you're not talking about it? Yeah, I think I, I had like all these goals and I'd write down like world champ by this year and like this and that. And I used to be so like visual and like, and look at this like every night. And then I was just like, you know what, like, if the results come, that's amazing. But right now, like I love where I am with surfing and how I've let my ego go a little bit more in year after year um, and how I've worked on things and let things go. Um, the energy where I spend my energy, who I want to spend it with. And I think in time, um, you know, I, I have always subconsciously wanted to win a world title and win events. And I haven't sacrificed 10 years of that to not. Um, is where I am. And I obviously want to do that and be a part of this like extension of Kauai and carry this like journey of the community and bring like, it would be so cool to bring back a world title to to Kauai, you know, like, I think about like, oh, Andy would be proud, you know, like things like that. Like, those are like little things. I want to do it for myself. But there's also like this other like drive of like, I want to represent this island. I want to, you know, like, be a world champ like Andy and like have like carry this like strength and raw grace fluidity of Kauai around the world um, and see what happens. And I mean, it's so perfectly timed because you're, you're doing that on the screen right now, the way you're surfing <laughs> this wave. Like it's, it is really, truly beautiful. And it's one of those things where it's kind of what I'm saying. It's, this is world title caliber surfing, like unquestionably and not, not, I mean, I'll speak for both the men's and women's tour. Not everyone on tour can do that. You know, like it's one of those things that psychologically, I know how much it means to start getting excellent scores, whether it's like eights or nines, because that means to the surfer, the judges think I can do this surfing. And this is the kind of surfing that wins world titles, you know, and not everyone can do that. You know, some people make it to the show and it's like, you know, they have a ceiling at seven. Um, 
I just think it's it's just really, really impressive. And you went on in this event to finish runner up, um, which matches your best CT result so far. Um, what do you think it is? What do you think is going to be that the degree of difference that pushes you over the edge to win a SET event? You know, I thought I was coming really close at Bells last year, um, just with the start and, you know, peaking in the final. I think um, carrying that energy and um, and kind of letting go by the time I, you know, I was always like such like a quarterfinals girl and a quarter, you know, fifth, fifth consistently. So now I'm working on the consistency of semis and finals and where do I, you know, um, where do I find my strengths and how do I use them and, you know, um, picking those out and w- how to take risks and show those in the moment. Do you think that changes your approach and pace from, you know, the opening rounds to the quarterfinals to that semi and final, or do you just surf as hard as you can in every heat? Totally. I think, um, I used to approach it like that, you know, you know, just getting through, just getting through. And now, um, more recently, Stace and I have been working on ways to, um, go beyond that and go beyond what I know. Like I know what to do to get a certain score, a six, a seven. And so how do I go and try to, um, take that risk and maybe fall and then deal with the pressure of waiting and having to get a bigger score on the next wave. Um, there's all these different, like, ways to approach a heat and different um things were trying to get me outside my comfort zone and really um you know develop being comfortable in uncomfortable situations in the earlier stages of the contest for sure and this is you cleaning up the heat on this last wave why don't you take us home Oh, I have a super funny fall, I think, on this wave. I'm just like, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to finish finish up the rear view. <sighs> I mean, memorable uh, event. Braids in the white shorts. That was like my my comeback uniform. <laughs> I love it. And why why number eight? Number eight um, is kind of like an infinity, um, you know, uh, sign. And also for Kobe's original number, um, in the NBA was my inspo for number eight. Do you like that? Well, if so, subscribe over there and then watch more videos over there. And then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.